It was a strange period, actually. I mean, I, the lamb kind of started for me. I can remember driving into Headley Grange. I had Andy, my first wife, with me, and I had Jolie with me. And it was this kind of, it was a bit like going into a Dickens novel, you know, it was like this th windows broken and rats everywhere. There were rats everywhere. Bad Company had used it and Zeppelin had used it and they'd recorded the When the Levee Breaks album there. But no one had cleaned up. <laughs> it was really odd. I mean, this poor woman that owned the house, I don't think she knew what she was letting herself in for. But you, literally there were rats everywhere. So you'd walk in and you'd be walking down the corridor and the two or three rats would walk past you. They wouldn't scurry away. they just walk, walk past you and you'd stop and look at you. Say, yeah, yeah, got a problem? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then the back of, in the back garden, there was these vines you know, up, the, up the back wall and you'd see this constant scurry of activity. And I, had, I was bringing a daughter into this, you know, where we were going to stay the night. I mean, at night when you went to bed, you could hear the scurrying around it. I mean, the place never slept. So, um, first of all, we had to clear up, but we never got rid of the rats. I mean, they were always there. Um, and it was kind of weird, weird time. I remember talking to Robert Plant about this. They worked in the same, same place. Zephyr worked at Headley Grange. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that place was haunted. I said, me too. I heard the sounds at night. I couldn't get off to sleep. That place was weird. So we took over the living room to write, and there was another room with a piano, which I guess during the first few weeks of this, there must have been discussions, which I was there for. But I don't remember much <laughs> about who wrote the lyrics. You know, it was one story, OK. One story, one lyric writer which I guess in theory is the way to go. But um, So what I remember most of, mostly about The Lamb was the four of us in the big room jamming and writing and recording on my Nakamichi, everything. And in the other room, Peter writing lyrics to the, the things that were already there. Uh, which means that, I mean, obviously we did play some stuff all together, but it, it was like him and us. It seemed, you know, my my my. my shutter went off at those moments, that's what I remember. Concept and lyric were all Peter's, and I'm not, I mean, I, 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 th I have to be honest, and I say that I think the, con the actual story is the weakest thing about the album. I mean, I don't think the story is really very gripping. Some of the individual lyrics are wonderful, I think, but the, the totality just doesn't, doesn't move me, it doesn't do anything for me, really. It, 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 it reads a bit like a sort of Kurt Vonnegut novel or something, you know, without perhaps quite as, quite as good imagery. Uh, and I just, that that's, always stays with me, really. It doesn't satisfy me. Uh, in the way that some of the other albums do. I mean, the, the Supper's Ready concept was a much simpler thing, you know, good and evil, you know, but that worked great, I think. But this one, um, not so well. The story is, in a way, it, uh, it's like a pilgrim's progress, but um, on the streets of New York. So it, it's, a, it's a spiritual journey in, into the soul, and um, but uh, this there's quite a tough world um, that is feeding the, uh, the imagery and the starting point. So uh, one of the influences um, on me was a film called El Topo by Alejandro Jodorowsky, who I invited later to work on a screenplay for The Lamb with me. And uh, this was... Um, a rough, visceral, um, cowboy, spiritual film, and it was unique at the time, uh, had a, a really strong cult following, and that was the blend that I was trying to put together in a way that would allow more people to try and travel with me. I think maybe we decided to do a double album to give ourselves a bit more space, as simple as that, I think, you know, you could do them and we felt the single album rather constrained you. And I think we had this idea, if I remember, that by making it a much longer uh, time scale to work on music, you know, you could do these little jams, improvisations, it would give us a chance to be a little bit freer with how we were playing, I think. I think when we started writing, and we seemed to have quite a lot of ideas on The Lamb, we thought it would be 
the idea of making it a double album concept would be adventurous and would be quite a nice thing to try and do, you know. Um, we had no idea what the, what the concept was going to be or anything, but we, we felt that the audience was, our audience would be able to take it, you know. And so we found it quite an exciting idea of things to do. And then obviously we had to set about and think about what was the concept going to be about. And uh, I think at this point, Peter sort of had an idea and, and he seemed quite keen to sort of to do all the lyrics, which was something which we'd never done before. The lyrics had been very much split throughout the group prior to this time. And we weren't really in favour of this, you know. I mean, to be honest, I think the rest of us, because it felt that it, gave, it would give the album a sort of bit, sort of one, a one-dimensional quality. And I, I think lyrically, I mean, for me, it, it does have that for that reason. And uh, but anyhow, I think you know, the, 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 perhaps the relationships in the group was was getting a little bit more. You know, it wasn't quite as easy as it once had been. Uh, probably because Peter was being thrust out as the star in a way. You know, the media would only concentrate on Peter really, which was kind of was a strange in a group that was. As sort of as democratic as we were in a way, you know, in the way everything came, the music and everything was done. Um, so that was a little bit difficult for us, I think. And obviously during the making of, uh, while we were actually writing this album, uh, Peter actually got an offer to um, to do this film script for William Friedkin. And, and he decided he was going to do it and went off. <laughs> and uh, that was in the middle of the writing. He looks at you once, you know he understands. I'd written a story, you know, from having done these introduction stories which went on the back of the live album and it was about a, a woman uh, who began sort of stripping in a tube train and um, taking off her clothes and anyway eventually she strips herself down and, and all that's left is this sort of tube of light and it was something that caught William Friedkin's fancy because he was Mr. Hot and Happening in Hollywood at the time because he'd just done Exorcist. Um, and he wanted to use that uh, power to try and reinvent Hollywood and bring in a whole new team of people. Um, and he invited me in as an ideas person, you know, to brainstorm and um, come up with different concepts in different areas. He'd actually approached Tangerine Dream to do the, the music. There was a guy called Philippe Drier, who was uh, uh, from Heavy Metal magazine. There was an um, animated designer that he wanted to, to work on some of the visuals. And to me, it was a very exciting opportunity. Um, not because it was Hollywood so much, but because uh, I, I love ideas, I love brainstorming with smart people, and uh, that was suddenly going to be given a vehicle and given a chance to uh, to come to life. So uh, I really wanted to do it. And I think uh, even though, you know, Phil has always been a sort of jobbing musician and doing other things, there was from, uh, I think, Tony and to some extent, Mike, this feeling, you know, well, I think it was a bit, you know, why should he have all the fun? <laughs> but. Um, it was the sense that, uh, you know, no, we're not happy to make time for you to go off and piss away in a valuable band time when you should be um, committed and turning up at nine o'clock every morning. And um, that was uh, a sort of hot, contentious issue. And so he did leave, you know, because we, we gave him an ultimatum. You choose freaking or you stay with the band. So he went, William Freakin sort of, I didn't want to split the band up. I don't even know if this is going to work. This is just an idea. So Peter comes back. But at that point, of course, we all know that, that this could happen at any time. Um, my first feeling when Peter left was, OK, well, we'll just... The vocals get in the way anyway. <laughs> Let's just do it instrumentally. <laughs> um, yeah, let's just get rid of all the vocals and just do it. We all like the instrument anyway. So... Um, so, uh, you know, of course, that was poo-pooed, quite rightly. And um, Peter came back, and we carried on writing. And then we went to Wales, this farm in Wales, to record it with John Burns and uh, Mobile. And that was great fun. We had our first child, uh, Jill, who was married to at the time. Um, it was... The you know, as it is for anyone, really, it's suddenly the most important thing in your life by a long way. Uh, and 
she, we had a disastrous birth. We were all set for sort of natural birth, putting her on the breast. She had an infection which was given to her from a, um, an epidural needle, which wasn't clean. Uh, so she had a fever. Uh, Jill had the fever. Cord round the neck. Um, <clears throat> lungs full of gunk. Everything was going wrong. Uh, and we didn't think she was going to survive. They put her in an incubator, um, carried her away like a piece of chicken carcass and wrapped up in silver paper. Um, and they actually wouldn't let my wife see her because they thought it would be cruel for her to bond with the baby who wasn't going to make it through. Uh, chances were so low. I mean, they wouldn't do that nowadays, but they thought they were being kind. Um, that was then the center of everything. And the band, of course, were recording instead of somewhere reasonably close to London, where we were in St. Mary's Paddington, uh, out in Wales. And I was making these sort of long pilgrimages um, beforehand, and then uh, I would be based here. And then whenever things looked better, I'd try and zoom back to Wales for the recording. So this was something that the band, uh, I think, would accept now, that they were not very understanding. And, uh, and I just lost it in lots of ways because I felt, you know, this is so obviously more important than uh, an album or anything else. Um, this is life and death, and it's the center of my family. That's where I need to be. Um, and there was a lot of resentment about that. So I think the seeds for the beginning of the end were sown at that point. To be honest, we were always looking back, we were so unsupportive. We were like young into the album, you know, intense, this is what we're doing, you know. And Pete, poor old Pete, having to, you know, deal with, with a, a terribly traumatic birth, and touch and go and dramas, you know. Um, we gave no help at all, actually, which it must have been hard. It was very difficult. Um, my marriage was breaking up. Um, uh, it looked as if, you know, we only had half a singer. Um, uh, the level of commitment to the band seemed, seemed shaky at that point. Um, so I, I, for me, it cast a pall on, on, on proceedings. And although I think it's a very, um, a very inventive album, and has got great moments on it. I, I still feel there was this sense of claustrophobia that, that um, accompanied it for me. The idea that we were still trying to employ the philosophy of everyone going away together and living together cheek by jowl, you know, but there were families, there were children. It, 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 it really wasn't a, a healthy kind of environment for, for everybody.